Galatians chapter 2, just to begin. It's difficult because the world around us we see every day. We experience it every day. We see it, we feel it, we taste it, we smell it, we engage with it. It is very real. And yet, this is not reality. This, as I've said before, is a digital simulation. And I don't mean in a spooky sci-fi way. When I meet, what I mean when I say that is this reality we live in is comprised of ones and zeros. Everything's made up of atoms, molecules, electrons, neutrons, all that stuff. We can break it down to the smallest particle. We see we, are tiny, we have tiny little building blocks. This has been constructed and we've been placed inside of it. And yet it only lasts for so long. Everything. Somebody said life is short. Another person said no, it's the longest thing that you'll do. And even that is not true. Eternity. Eternity still waits. And it's with all of that as our foundation, I want to continue our series on walking in the Spirit tonight. Galatians chapter 2. <laughs> um, and I want, to, I want to spend just a moment here in verse number 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. I want to kind of dovetail off of a Sunday school lesson from... Uh, last week here, uh, he says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Paul says, the life that I now live in the flesh, <laughs> I live by the faith of the Son of God. We've talked about the flesh and the spirit. We've talked about uh, living a holy life, living a crucified life. We've talked about being ambassadors for Christ in Sunday school. We talked about our love for God. We talked about our love for others. Tonight, in our text for the, for the series in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, he tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love. And this will be the last message on love, unless the Lord directs us back toward that this year. Love. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And it can be difficult living this physical life for God. Because this physical life is all around us. It's, to us, it's real. It's tangible. I can put my hands on it. I can put work in it and see things happen right away. But the spiritual life, things that are eternal, I don't see those right away. We live in an instant gratification <laughs> day and age. I, I needed to print the lyrics for the song for us to sing tonight. And I got on the computer. And I got frustrated that the computer was running slow. And I had been sitting down for maybe five, ten seconds. We expect it right now. We expect it exactly when we push the button, it should happen. Uh, I mean, I am, I am blown away by the things you can get out of a vending machine these days. Push a couple buttons. And I mean, they've got places over in Japan. Their technology is so far ahead of ours. In just a couple of minutes, you can have a pizza, fresh baked pizza with custom toppings out of a vending machine. Carvana, they sell carbs out of a vending machine. At least that's what they claim. I don't know. We want it now. We need to see results now. You tell somebody, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, interest rates, CDs, things like that. People tying up money for, you know, amounts of years. Well, we could put it away for five years and get this rate for five years, or we could go 18 months and we get the same rate for 18 months, right? Somebody goes, 18 months? That's a year and a half. You know what can happen in a year and a half? What can I get today? What can I get right now? Walk into an establishment, Little Caesars. Uh, I'm sure there's other ones that have this. You can order something, or you can get what's hot and ready right now. Walk-in pizza. The, the Italians must be just, just pulling their hair out. You want a pizza now? You want a pizza now? You got to wait, right? Wait for that good stuff. This is the struggle of the Christian life, is it not? Because not only do I have to wait for some things, I pray for things, I, I wait for things to come and in God's timing, right? We say that often. God's timing is always best. You know why we say that? Partially because we believe it. But because it's what we have to tell ourselves to get used to waiting on God. That's the real honest truth of it. Well, God, God's timing's best. And we, we do believe it. But it's because we get used to not having things instantaneously. 
You know what God would do with us if he gave us everything we wanted right when we wanted it? We'd spoil it and consume it upon our lusts. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And we've looked at our love for God. We've looked at our love for others. Tonight, let me share with you our love of the world. In John chapter 3, go there with me. We're going to spend a little bit of time in John's writings tonight. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I, what did I order? I ordered something off of Amazon. It was a book. I think it was a book. And uh, I did not need it in a hurry. I was preparing some things for Sunday school and I realized one of the study books that I had, I, I couldn't find it. And I thought in the back of my head, I was almost certain I gave it to one of my brothers with the intention I would buy myself another copy. You know, never got around to buy any other copy. It's a real important book. <laughs> and so I jumped online, you know, Amazon.com. And I, it was, it's the kind of book I can't get in a local bookstore. I can't find There's no Christian bookstores anymore, anywhere. So jumped on Amazon, ordered it. And within seconds, I get an email. Your order's been received. And a few minutes later, your order's being pulled together. Within an hour, your order will arrive tomorrow. And sure enough, it was there tomorrow. A book. I didn't need it that bad, but just... Any information that I want that I can't get readily from the internet, I can have to my house within 24 hours. Like that. That's the world we live in today. And it makes it hard sometimes to live the Christian life. In John chapter 3, now I didn't tell you the verse because you wouldn't turn there. Look with me in verse number 16. Jesus has gone back and forth with Nicodemus. Ye must be born again. Right? It's the only place in scripture where we see this account. Verse 16 gives us the reason. For God so loved the world. Did you ever have someone impose a rule on you that they did not follow themselves? It's frustrating. Um, I try to watch that as a parent. I tell my kids, I will not demand anything from you that I do not hold to myself. You know, God does that, though. He says to us, To be careful what we love here in this earth. And in John chapter 3, we read, we, read, we read the words that God loved the world. And we're going to get there in just a minute, but we know the verse in 1 John 2. The first four words are love not the world. The world. Could it be that our Heavenly Father imposes a rule upon us that he does not follow himself? Go with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Now we'll clear that up when we get to 1 John, but let me give you an introduction. When God says he loves the world, and when he tells us not to love the world, he's not referring to the same two things. He's referring to the same place, he's referring to the same people, but he's referring to them in very different contexts. John chapter 12, verse number 25. Here's the, this gives us a little more context. John 12, verse 25. The Lord says, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Do you love your life? He that will love life and see good days. Should we love our life in this world? If I were to take a poll and say, how many of you love your life? I hear people say it all the time. It's almost a, it's almost a cliche thing that I love my life. It's great. And uh, I'll tell you, I do. Uh, I've got a good life. Uh, now, of course, it doesn't come without its troubles. It doesn't come without its roadblocks and hurdles and, and issues. But I love my life. 
Uh, I, I might not choose it exactly the way that it is, but it's what God gave me, and he's helped me through it. And uh, all my past and my history and all that makes up who I am, who I am today. Heard a fantastic uh, uh, speech today uh, by a young man, spoke of a woman um, who went to a party and um, uh, bad things happened and she ended up with child after this party uh, against her will. And uh, he said, eight, nine months later, she gave birth to me. And uh, he said, you know, I lived, I survived. And he had made this uh, platform, this little podium thing. Uh, for making uh, speeches. He was uh, adamantly um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, vocally against abortion and had, had, sp had spoke that way. And uh, when the, um, if I understand it correctly, when the uh, overturning of Roe v. Wade happened, it was his little platform thingy in his area at least that that announcement came out. And he said, over the little tiny lectern that I made, he looks at his life and he said, well, it wasn't exactly what I wanted it to be. No, would I choose those things for myself? No. But he said, I was given up for adoption. I was adopted by a Christian family. I was raised in the church. And what God has done with my little life that if the world looked at it said, what do you have? I have so much. I, I love my life. But I don't love my life <laughs> in this world. He says, if we love our life, he that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Those are strong words. Those are hard to reconcile. I don't hate my life. I, 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 even the physical aspects of it, I, I've been born into pretty good position. Been born into uh, you know uh, what what a lot of people call privilege, and uh, some of it definitely is. Uh, I've been born into circumstances that I'm in. I'm in a good country. I had a good family. I. I mean, sure, we, we've had our issues, but I'll tell you what, if, if I had to ch choose it based on uh, even other people's lives that I know, I'd, I'd probably pick mine. I don't hate it. But when it comes to spiritual things, when we talk about walking in the spirit, we have to hate our life in this world. God loved the world. But he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Look at me, verse uh, or chapter fifteen, John chapter fifteen, John fifteen. John chapter fifteen, verse number nineteen. And I'm I'm laying a front porch here. The message will be real short when we're done. Cowboys are playing. we got places to be. <laughs> That's a joke. I haven't looked at the score. I will not look at the score. We're here to do what God needs to have done. John chapter 15 and verse number 19, Jesus says, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. All right, so what have we established so far? God loved the world, and if we love our life in this world... We'll lose it. But if we hate our life in this world, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it and uh, we'll, we'll earn it unto eternal life. And then he says that if we were of the world, the world would love us. But because the world hates us, then we know we're not of the world and they should hate us. There's a lot of us, we, and them going on in these passages. There's a lot of love and hate going back and forth. What is the conclusion that we can come to? We must remember we are of two worlds. Talked about it a little bit this morning. We are of this earth, or at least we're in this earth. And there has to be a level of us functioning with our life. There has to be. We can't dig a hole in the ground, stick our head in it, and say, just even so, come Lord Jesus. We have to go to work. We have to buy cars. And we can buy nice cars. And we have to, we can buy nice cars. Some of us don't, but we, we can. We buy a house. Got to live there, right? Got to keep it heated. Got to have all the amenities, you know? And if you, if you listen to some, you have to buy a private jet, you know. Uh, I listened to somebody the other day. Boy, I'll tell you what. He said, God would no more desire you. Did I tell you this already? I don't have friends, so you hear all the stuff that I <laughs> He said, God would no more desire you to live in poverty than he would for you to live in adultery. And he went on and waxed eloquent about how poverty was a sin. <laughs> Boy, then the church is in trouble. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, I've seen a lot of God's people. I'm talking people that are living for God. None of them are very, very wealthy. There's some that do well, business owners and such. 
But the ones that are really living for God, the ones that are really pursuing him with their lives and trying to walk in the spirit, there just seems to come about a, a level of mediocrity to life. And I think that's because God does not want us to get comfortable here. God does not want us to hang on to this life. John 17, Jesus says, I've given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And we spoke about being ambassadors for Christ this morning. And there is this strange frustration that when we live for God, all those that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Life will be hard because God calls us to be in the world and not of it. We don't get to fit in with the crowd. We don't get to fit in with the norm. We don't get to go with the flow. We don't get to do what's easy. God has called us to something bigger. <laughs> and I preach this as part of this series because of 1 John chapter 2. Turn there with me and we'll, we'll really start to get into the meat of it tonight. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter two, look at verse number um, 15. First John 2:15. Here's the verse: "Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him." This brings my mind to Jesus as he gives the example of no man can serve two masters. Or either he will hate the one and despise the other, or he'll, I forget how it goes, but you understand the concept. You cannot serve God and mammon, he says. Mammon we often refer to as money, but it means so much more than that. It means material things. It means the things in this life. Love not the world. You know what that means for you, Christian? That means that we ought not be so invested in what's going on around us. That when we hear the news and we hear about the world and where it's going and what it's going in, it ruins our day. What that means for us as Christians is that when the wrong person gets put in the White House, we're doomed. This is the beginning of the end. I'll tell you what. Have you seen how bad it's getting out there? Of course I have. Of course I have. I'm expecting it. As a matter of fact... Folks talk about hope for the next election, and don't get me wrong, that's a different message, patriotism and all of that, and wanting our country to live for God, that's different. But I'm talking about our overall view of the world and what God has placed us into and our relationship with it. We hang on to this world sometimes. We get all tied up in knots and, and consumed by it. Love not the world. I'm, I'm going to be careful when I say this. There are some folks out there that claim to be Christians and are far more concerned with the organic material of the earth, the trees and the polar bears and all that, than they are about the souls of men that live there on this earth. Love not the world. He says, neither the things that are in the world. And if not loving the world doesn't hit home for you, not loving the things of the world probably gets closer. That's tough. This world has some nice things. Uh, we rented a car a little while back here. And uh, nice car. <laughs> My wife got a, a good deal on it. And uh, going up to Pennsylvania, we had to haul all the Christmas gifts up and all the Christmas gifts back. And uh, I'll tell you what, it had heated seats. It had a heated steering wheel. You know what that meant for me growing up and most of my life? It meant this. This thing had everything. Everything. We had to take it back. We cried a little, you know. It'd be nice. This, this was nice. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. The things in the world. There's a lot that we could love. There's entertainment and leisure and 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 possessions and things money 
Those are nice things. They're enjoyable. There, there's pleasure in this life if we want to seek it out. And you say, but doesn't God want us to be happy? Yes. But he wants us to be happy with the things he's provided for us. You say, well, does that mean we can never relax? Does that mean we can never buy nice things? Does that mean we can't rent nice cars and we can't have nice clothes and we can't have a nice house or whatever it may be? No. But don't love it more than God. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You say, so if I love the world, God won't love me? Nope, nope, nope. That's not what he says. He says, if you love the world, there's no more space for you to love God. And that must be first. Talked about that a few weeks ago. God will not share the throne of your heart. God will not split time with anything else. God will not share you with your things and your funds and your entertainment and all of that. He wants to be first. You say, wasn't that selfish of him? I think he's earned it. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You say, I don't believe that. Take it up with the guy that wrote the book. If you love the world, you cannot love God the way he expects you to. It says verse 16. And it's not that he says that blindly. It's not that he says, you can't have all those nice things. You can't live for yourself. That would be selfish. You need to live for me. No, look at what he says. And, and, and our perspective of this earth needs to come from the God that created it and the God that has allowed it to go on. Verse 16, he says, for all, all, say it with me, all, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All of it, everything this world has to offer, it's not of the Father, but is of the world. There are preachers today that from the pulpit are trying to preach a gospel and Christian life that is 100% founded upon the things of this world. We're going to look at that verse next. Verse number 17. Not only... Are the things of this world not of God, and they cannot cohabitate. Not only that, God gives us eternal wisdom in verse 17 when he says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I want to tell a story here. I'm going to take it completely out of context, but it, it opened my mind to some things. I had a friend growing up that... Um, as many young men do, uh, he fancied a young lady. And he was a very independent person. He was very, uh, he knew exactly who he was and exactly what he wanted. And uh, he was a self-contained human being. He did not need another person in life. For whatever reason, this girl caught his eye. And we had a conversation one day. He said, I need your help with this. <laughs> he said, how can I allow myself to break down whatever I've built up as a defense to let someone become my everything? To fully give over to them, to give myself to them 100%. And I thought, boy, this sounds really selfish, but he wasn't done yet. He said, how can I open my heart and open my life and allow that person in fully knowing that I've got myself to that point and there's even the slightest possibility that I will lose them? And I thought, wow. I don't know that I've ever thought about anything that deeply. <laughs> I don't believe I was even married at the time. Why he was asking me, I don't know. Uh, this young man, still unmarried to this day, by the way, and has given me more sage wisdom when it came to marriage than many uh, married people have in their life. 
And my answer was, was probably pretty stupid, but it, it resonated with him. His great love in life was guns. And the second great love in life was his dog. And I said, you have a dog, right? He said, yeah. I said, you know full well when you got that dog, you were going to outlive it, right? I said, yeah. I said, why'd you get it? What, did, what's, what didn't stop you? He said, hmm. And I thought, I just compared this woman to a dog. <laughs> we're still friends, though. <laughs> But I thought about that concept. That must be the way God looks at us when we say, God, I, I want that really bad. And God says, why on earth would you want to take all that I've given you and peel it all back? The eternalness of our relationship, the, 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 the righteousness that you have, the sanctification my, the standing of you being my child, all of this, to take me out of the way and to take a football game and put it in that spot when you know full well it's all going to burn away and it'll never matter. We have to see it from his perspective. You see, when God looks at this world, and when we look at this world, we see it very differently. When I look at this world, it is everything to me. I cannot imagine something properly outside of this world, this life, the time that I have, my lifespan. It is, there, there is nothing past that that I, that I know perfectly, that I know for sure. I have faith. And I try to imagine it. I try to imagine what, what, what it looks like outside of this world, and outside of this life. But when God looks at it, it's like a timeline that starts in that corner and goes to this wall and to that wall and to that wall, back to that corner, and spirals around this room and wallpapers it about 70 different layers thick and then ends back at that corner. And if you could take that line of paper and run it out, you could probably run it states away. And this world is about that big. You probably can't even see it from where you are. I can barely see it from here. And God says, you're going to trade me for that? It's, it makes us sound foolish. It makes us sound selfish. But rest assured, God knows what it's like to make that choice. God knows what it's like to struggle with that. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2. And I could stand here tonight and try to guilt you into, you know, you shouldn't love this, you shouldn't love that, this world, it's going to pass away. Why would you hold on to it? Well, because today my flesh thinks that that is exactly what I need. And today my physical mind, my lizard brain, as the scientists like to talk about, thinks that that's the answer. The question is, will we walk after the flesh or will we walk in the spirit? Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8. He says, beware. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You know why I take every opportunity to preach reading the Bible, studying the Bible, meditating upon the Bible? It's not so we can check off a list and say, oh, I read the whole Bible this year. It's not so I can say, well, our whole church, we're reading the exact same thing, and we're reading the same thing. We have our Sunday afternoon nap. We're all in this. No, no. It's because the only way to get our minds in the place where we will value spiritual things above things of the world is by getting it washed and renewed by the word. To have our minds transformed. Romans chapter 12. Be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
love not the world. But that's not enough. If we just try to shun the world, and we hear a worldly song and say, no, I won't love it. And we see some worldly fashion and we say, no, I won't love it. Or we hear about some new thing that's out there, some new toy, whatever, whatever your hobbies are, whatever your interests are, whatever comes your way. And they say, hey, this is the perfect thing for you. No, no, I won't love it. That won't be enough. We have to love him. We have to follow him. We have to be enraptured with him just to get our eyes off of the world. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Then the things of earth will grow strangely dim. We try to do it the other way around. We try to put blinders on and say, I won't love the world. I won't love the world. I won't love the world. Hey, look at that. <laughs> We talk about the kids um, with ADHD, which stands for attention deficit. That chair needs to be clean. That's a joke. Spiritually, that's how we are. We have an attention deficit. We can't keep our attention on God. And boy, I'm looking forward to the day where I don't have to govern that anymore. There won't be any distractions. There won't be anything that tempts me to love it more than I love God. He will be my everything. To the point, and I can't even, I can't, I cannot grasp this yet to the point that even my wife won't matter that day. My family won't matter. My church won't matter. This physical book won't matter. But it'll be him. And I won't have to struggle. I won't have to fight. I won't have to try. But now, I do. Because a great battle is being waged over your heart. Whether it will follow him, or whether it will follow you. Go to 2 Timothy 4 and we'll finish tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I've been asked I've been asked a lot of questions many times but one question that I get a lot is why don't people come to church and that's a across the board lost saved whatever it may be why don't folks come to church you used to be able to pack out a church Sunday mornings that's where everybody was no car in the driveway it's at the church people dressed up people there in the pew I mean you just expect it see somebody in a, in a shirt and tie at the gas station on Sunday well where are you headed Oh, it's Sunday, right. <laughs> I, I changed into regular old civilian clothes today. We were out. My whole family was dressed up and I wasn't. And I thought, this is what this feels like. I, I don't know. <laughs> Normally, if anybody's dressed up in our family, it's me. And like it or not, the answer to that question is, they love the world a little bit more than they love the Lord. I say that right? The world over the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10. Paul is speaking here to Timothy and going over different things and kind of setting about his, uh, his needs. And in verse number 12, he says, Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. Verse number 11, he said, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him. He's... he's giving these different reports on the men that help him. But in verse 10, he says, For Demas, well, look at verse 9. This is the command to Timothy. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Why? Verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed on the Thessalonica. Paul had a friend. Paul had a helper. Paul had someone that he could count on. And one day, he just stopped coming around. One day he just stopped being there for Paul. I don't know if he told him. I mean, obviously he knows where he's going. He knows the reasons why he's going. Maybe they had a conversation. Maybe they had an argument. But one thing's for sure. Paul says, Demas left. And it's because he just loves this world a little too much. 
I don't ever want that to be said about me, even for a day, even for a moment. Love not the world, Christian, neither the things that are in the world, not just to keep us under God's thumb, not just because he deserves our love more than those other things, but he tells us because what this world has to offer is going to crumble to dust and blow away. It will not last. You're going to struggle. There's going to be days where it'll be hard to choose. Do I choose family or God? Do I choose my health or my spiritual life? Some days it's going to seem like the right choice. Lord, I know, I know. But you don't understand. He understands. And he begs us not to love the world. It's a necessity. We have to be here. We don't have to be of it. Some of you have a knot in your stomach right now because I did not pray before I started preaching. And that was by design. Because instead of praying and asking God preemptively to get in on a message, I want to end in prayer and ask God to take this message and go with us. Because the easiest place in the world not to love it is here. We're around the music, the word of God, the Holy Spirit moves and we're encouraged. And I'll tell you what, I could probably live a pretty close to perfect Christian life if it was just in church. But I can't do that. I got places to be. I got people to see. <laughs> I got to see a man about a dog. There's things in this life that must be done. And it's going to be hard some days not to love it. There's a lot of stuff that's in the world that is tailor-made to make you want it. Phoenix just did a uh, social studies project. And the conclusion he came to was about the power of marketing and uh, some pretty interesting stuff. This world is designing its products to catch your eyes, the lust of the eyes, and to make you think, I need that. That's the lust of the flesh. And to say, if you don't have it, you're not cool. That's the pride of life. God's laid it out all here for us. He warns us against it. Christian, don't love this world. Don't love what it has to offer. Use it for what you need. Let's get our eyes on Jesus, fixing our eyes on him, seeking those things which are above. And when we start there, it'll be easy for us to say, I don't, I don't need this world. I don't need this life. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful today for your dealings with us. Lord, we are grateful with the knowledge that we know you know what it's like to live this life. You know what it's like to live in temptation and, and to be given opportunities to allow this world to become more important to us. Lord, it is my prayer, and I, I hope the prayer of those that are here with me, that we would fix our eyes on you and adjust our love for you, Lord, that it might be deep and true and devoted to, Lord, help us not to love the world or the things that are in it. Help us, Lord, to look for ways to get you in our mind, in our life, in our speech. Lord, that it might shield us from the trappings of this life. Pray as we go out into our Monday, as we head out into our week, as this world encloses around us, Lord, that you would help us to keep our eyes where they should be and that we might have an eternal and divine perspective on all of it. Lord, and when we fail, Lord, we will look to you. Lord, when this world gets to be a little too important to us, may your word remind us of where our affections should be. And Lord, that we would come back like the prodigal, knowing what we have at the house of the Father. Lord, I pray you'd go with us this week, go before us this week. I pray that you'd dwell with us this week. Be in all that is said and done, that you would have the preeminence in all things, until we meet again here at this place, in Jesus' name, amen.